I, uh, I want to make that clear. I want to make that clear. Any question you ask, you are asking on behalf of somebody else. Okay? So if you're like, I think my friend would misunderstand this. We're going to help your friend. <laughs> Amen. Holy Spirit, you know what they need to hear and where they are in their faith. And you know I don't want to be a heretic. So <laughs> guide this conversation today and what questions we can answer. May they go well. And those that we don't, may you have chosen them on purpose to be saved for later. In your name we pray. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, because I have no life, I have <laughs> typed up every question you asked you really? and tried to put them in a category wow. so that yeah. we could try to have some semblance of a flow. You like that, right? Um, and so I'm going to start with the questions about me because that's the best topic. <laughs> so somebody asked what my vocation story is. Beautiful question. If you want, you go on YouTube and you can find a mini 10 minute version of it. For today, I'll just say, I did not want to enter seminary. Really? Like people, I'm not lying. I'm not old Phil, I'm not lying. Um, it was not my choice. I wanted to be married. I thought little me's were gonna be amazing for the world. Uh, and uh, people have been telling me my whole life, you should consider priesthood, consider priesthood. I just assume any person they see praying on any sort of regular basis, they assume you should be a priest. So I took it as a compliment and moved on. As I was going through college, it was on my heart a bit more. And so I actually was quite hesitant dating in college because I didn't want to mess a relationship up. So did you date by, Listen, women love me. Uh, 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 no, nothing official, honestly. There was no official dating in college. Um, and then at the end, before I officially graduated, I went on a vocational retreat, thought that was it. God was quite quiet on the retreat. I thought he was saying marriage. I said, cool, let's do it. So I went about six years of my life, and then he came back and was like, mm, you should probably consider this. I said, too late. Uh, obviously, I lost that battle. Um, <laughs> But the part that I would say is the turning point for me was he put me in front of an image of the agony in the garden. And it was him telling me I didn't want what I had to do for the Lord either. And so from that point, I told him yes. And somebody had asked, I'll get to it, um, a form of like, how can we be confident in God's plan? When I said, I said, I said yes, I actually told him fine. Like that was my response to it. I said, I won't ignore you anymore, so all right, let's do it. And each piece, from meeting with the vocation director, to getting the application, to filling it out, each brought more and more peace. And so that's how I began to realize, all right, like I'm actually starting to get excited about this, to the point where when the bishop called me to tell me I was in, I was in the house by myself, I was hyped. I'm like, oh, stress, man, this is it, boy. Like, I was in. And as I reflected, I said, that was a clear sign to me that by my saying yes, even reluctantly, God was like, that's all I need. And so that's how pretty much I'm here. Did I face any resistance from my parents, anybody? I worked at a Catholic school as a school counselor prior to entering seminary. I told them, you would have thought I was the Pope. I mean, they celebrated like nobody's business. Like, they were like, oh! He's one of us, he's gonna be a priest. Like it was, it was fantastic. Um, my parents were on board. My brother, who I was living with and spent, like paying half the bills with, I was concerned with, I told him, and he was like, Really? Okay. I said, Oh, nice. So, uh, so no real issues throughout it. I will say that there was an undertone of concern because obviously things with the black community haven't been the smoothest and things with just priests haven't been the smoothest. And I'm about to be both. So um, there were concerns of what that would look like, but no real resistance, just trust in God there. Um, what has been the most difficult experience I've ever faced? And how have I looked at it as a part of God's plan for me? Um, so I'll start with most recent and work back. Uh, most recently, it's been trying to figure out 
the best way to be black and Catholic. Um, we're going to fast forward. That can be a different conversation if you'd like. But the fast forward version is I was finding my identity in my blackness instead of my identity as a son of God. And as soon as I became a son of God and saw my blackness as a gift, now if you reject a gift, that's on you. I'm just offering the gift. But my identity has never changed. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as I got that better understanding, I could start working with the world's issues a bit, a bit different. Um, and then in a more traditional sense, I lost my best friend in 2012. And what was most difficult was like the night before, he was talking to me, we're in the hospital, I'm with his brother, and he told his brother, buy me some Triscuits and get my dry clean. So I thought we were cool. The next day, it was in the afternoon, his brother called me, said it's not looking great, so I just assumed it was gonna be a long night. I, so I ate, got ready, showered, and I didn't make it in time. So he had passed prior to my arrival, and the harder part too was they didn't know his friends. I had to call everybody to tell them what happened. And that, uh, that, that, was, that was difficult. Um, looking back, in a very simple sense, I mean, I have a hard time looking at better preparation than going through something like that when you're working with your parishioners or friends and they've lost a loved one. Like to lose a family member is different than to lose a friend, but to be able to reach into that empathy and that pain and speak to them on a level of understanding uh, is a gift. And I was able to do that as a school counselor and I assume it'll just pick up as a priest. Um, it's so hard, but I am very confident my buddy Ron L's in heaven, so he's not suffering and that pain will help me to ease that suffering for others. Um, what is the worst advice I've ever received? Real talk. So I'm in confession. And I just want to be honest with you. I just want to be honest with you. Um, I was talking to him like, I, I'm struggling to not look at women with lust. Like I'm trying to look at them with love. And my man told me, well, are you saying that? I was like, yeah. He's like, get a girlfriend, that'll help. <laughs> no, man. Like, even, even high school me was like, I don't think that's the right answer, bro. Like, I don't think that's the move, man. So, uh, so that was definitely the worst advice that I received. Uh, God bless me that I didn't take it. Uh, so, uh, so we're going to that, we're gonna call that section the questions of me. Uh, any quick follow-up to any of that? Right on. So, um, the next part I thought would, would be great for you guys to have a better understanding of is some of y'all ask questions on prayer. So I cheated. The diocese put some amount of salt prayer to that joint out. And um, so if you guys want to pass this around for me. So I'll handle the questions a little bit, but I feel like this will be better. Um, one of you is going to need to make a few copies because I only printed 30 and there's more than 30, so we need more than 30. Um, but uh, somebody asked tips on mental prayer. I would say the largest tip I have for, for prayer, just an easy general, are we doing alright? We're going to make it? We good? Okay. Um, is have a plan. If you just go in and you're not quite there as far as a prayer herb, uh, you will get distracted pretty easily. And so have a plan. What you'll see on the form are two forms of praying with the Bible. I tried to like, use spiritual reading pretty exclusively, or um, right now I'm working through a consecration to God's merciful love. And for a while, I wasn't using scripture itself. That was a significant mistake. <clears throat> to pray without the actual word of God it sounds silly to say it out loud. Um, and so what you're seeing is a combination of Lexio Divina, um, Ignatian prayer, and then for me what I found to be the most helpful was a list of Bible verses that you can go to to start working on those types of prayers. Um, and so that's, I'll leave that kind of to the paper and you can pick that conversation up um, 
as we go. For the other piece, too, is um, scriptural reading is a big deal. If you're like me, I've become a scriptural listener as well. I've bought a lot of books on Audible and found a lot of YouTube videos that if I'm cleaning my room, I can just hit play. And um, that's what happened here, because I have no TV in my room, and so my life changed. And, um, but I've made it through three books in my like week and a half here that I would have never done before. Um, so if you're not quite there yet to sit and just take it in, then find something mindless and just listen. And uh, I found the New Testament on Audible, and so I'm just listening to the Word of God, and that's kind of cool. Um, the other thing, too, is the rosary. That's difficult, but everybody say, you got to pray the rosary. I was skeptical, not because I don't love Mary, but because I didn't want that to be true, because the rosary felt boring to me. But to be honest with you, um, how I've talked myself into it and have seen the fruits of it is... Um, for those of us with a mother that we care about, she can do an activity. So for me, she would like Joanne Fabrics or Michaels, hated those places. But the idea that I would even go with her reluctantly to those places made her happy. And so if that's your idea of how you begin the rosary, like, Mom, I love you. People say, you want me to do this to spend time with you? That's why I'm doing it. She will be so pleased if that's even how you start with the rosary. Um, and I'll tell you the rosary, powerful, powerful. How can you contemplate through prayer? What does it mean to contemplate in the Catholic sense? So it actually has a little phrase on the, on the sheet, but in my own words, you're trying to tap into what heaven will be like. You're just being with God. That is difficult, especially if you're distracted, but that's the aim. So it's less words, like mental prayer can still contain words, contemplation is just like, I'm with God. And so this, okay, it's gonna sound funny, but this is a real thing I do. I call it a soul hug. So I'll close my eyes and I picture just me in soul form hugging Jesus. And I just stay in that embrace. And that's how I've tried to work through contemplating it. And then it started going like St. Martin de Porres, my dude. Um, so we got a soul dat. Um, and then uh, I'll actually do it so like those that I can see are suffering, but they don't open up, I it, like mentally hug their soul. I'm like, I can see you're not ready for that interaction, but this is how close I can come to just loving you spiritually. And so my soul hug is kind of encompassed quite a bit, but in the deepest sense, it's how I try to just like use the physical pieces that I know to be in the presence of God. Um, so that's it in my own words. Their words may be more powerful for you. Um, how do I actually speak to Jesus? Uh, develop a relationship? Do I speak out loud? Also, I can't concentrate in prayer. I feel you there. Um, but that goes back to come with a plan. Uh, yeah, when I won't look crazy, I absolutely talk out loud to God. Absolutely do. And sometimes I didn't realize someone came into the church, and so I look crazy. That's fine. Um, but it's just, again, I, am, I realize like my body's important to my soul. And so the more I can use things that are like tangible, the easier it is for me to get into the faith. And so, yes, I talk out loud. If I trip over something, I don't think anybody around, I laugh at Jesus. I'll be like, man, why you put that rock there, Jesus? It's messed up. <laughs> like, and so we just build a relationship in that way. And that helps me to then take it into, like, when I used to play soccer, when I used to coach, um, anything that I would do, as I started just, like, almost messing around with it, it just became a habit of interacting with Jesus regularly. Um, and so yes, talk out loud, bring him into everything you do. Um, other notes, because I think, no, lies. Uh, so I just threw it in here because I wanted to. Uh, Prayer-wise, do not fear dryness in prayer. Do be like, I just don't feel anything. Sometimes when God knows that you are there, that you're going to continue to come to him, he is going to make prayer harder to make you choose him for the simple fact of choosing him. Because if you only chose him because of a feeling or because you felt loved after, 
Now you're coming potentially for the feeling as opposed to him. And so do not fear the dryness. He may just be calling you deeper to continue to choose him. And I promise you the dryness will end. Um, the only person I've heard that had large spouse of it was Mother Teresa. She is saint. So if that's you, more power to you. <laughs> like, it's not like, but for every normal person, dryness ends. You just have to keep showing up and persist through. Um, to what extent should emotions play a role in prayer? Emotions are a symptom of our inner disposition. So if I'm angry, and I can't figure out why. Like, I can go in and be like, God, I am upset right now, man. Why? And let that be a way to figure out what's going on interiorly. If you're sad, if you're happy, whatever it is, have no fear with the emotion. It's just, like, if I have a cough, I might be sick. The same way with emotions. And so, yes, they absolutely have a place in prayer. Because um, God will help you work through them if you open yourself to that. Uh, do I have advice for confidence or avoiding doubt when listening to God? Um, I think I'll also answer this in other ways. And so I'll just say this for this question is remember he loves you. And if you make a mistake, he can work with it. Like God is too powerful for you to mess his plans up. And so did he mean for me to spend nine years between 2010 and when I entered seminary? Was that his direct will? I don't know. But I got there. And he can work with me. So if you're like, is this you, God? Is this it? Then start walking in that direction. I heard somebody say, God, I can't move a parked car. Like your GPS will just keep staring at you if you don't start moving the car. <laughs> Let him redirect you as you see fit. Do not fear that. Um, so that's my prayer section. The next is vocational questions. So I'm gonna go into that because they're kind of related. Um, what are tips for discerning? Pray, obviously. And for me, it's only me, I started thinking about my specific discernment less and aimed for holiness. And through building that relationship with God, I'll tell you, I was not asking him in 2018, what do you want my vocation to be? He came to me. And for me personally, I only share this because it was my personal story. This does not mean it's going to be yours. When he was calling me, it sounded very much like my own voice. And just in my head, it was like, become a priest. Become a priest. Become a priest. In the same way, I could tell myself, get married. Get married. But this was not a thought that I willfully thought. And it was just made clear to me in that way. And so I share that to just say, it can be confusing, but God will let you know if you build that relationship with him. Um, how do you start discerning? Be Catholic, like just start. <laughs> like there's no real like, today, I'm gonna start with a date. This is when I started discerning. No, your discernment story is your whole life. And God will bring you to where he wants you to be. Just keep building it. Um, how do I tell if it's God and not Satan? Listen, Satan ain't tricky enough, so if you walk in the wrong direction, God will be like, hold up, player, and we'll get you where you need to go. <laughs> so keep building that relationship with him. If it was Satan, you will learn, and God will use that lesson to make you a better person for him and for others. And you'll also start being able to tell, is that a, oh, bless you, child. Do you know you were three scenes, or is that it? No. You good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, do not fear that peace as much because God is far too powerful. You just focus on your relationship with him and Satan becomes less and less relevant in your life. Um, how will you know that the path you think is your vocation truly? Similar to what we already talked about. You have a peace. You have a peace as you go through it. Um, could you explain a bit more about the role of patience in your vocational discernment? It's funny because Father Riley at the seven also talked about this. Patience comes from the Latin word meaning to suffer. And I 100% believe that God will use that suffering to get you to your vocation. And so you have to be patient. He'll put you through some things and it's all for your benefit. Um, like if you hear somebody who's like, yeah, my vocation was easy. <laughs> You're not really living it out there because that's not how God works with us in this life. Um, 
So that is that two sections. Before I move on, anything we can talk about? I'm gonna still drink water, so. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> no, no, they're just taking it in. They're just taking it in. I respect that. I respect that. So some of y'all asked, like, you questions. Um, and so there are a few of those that were like, how can I use the suffering I have endured to evangelize others without sounding or being egotistical through? Depends on who you're talking to. So if you were to be in this position, talking to your peers right now, to share your testimony, I wouldn't fear that because we all know it's God's work through you. If you're speaking to somebody who you can see is suffering, but may not be as much a believer, I would encourage you to first just listen. Let them hear, or excuse me, let them be heard, take it in, empathize with them, and build a relationship first. When that relationship is built, you can say, you know, I would love for you to come to adoration with me. I have not brought up my own success yet, but I know what caused my success. And so I want to bring this person on the journey with me. And so that would be how I would take your suffering and build that relationship and bring it into friendship with somebody else. And then through that, you can then relate to them. Like if they come out crying, be like, yeah, God, go here, brother. Mm -hmm, do it. And then you can then speak to, like, this was my experience. And this is why I shared my Lord with you. Because of how much he helped me. Because if you force it down them, they'll reject it. If you walk with them, they'll love you for it. Uh, how can I realign my sense of trust? Say, so I struggle with being overly trusting then I don't trust the times I should. Uh, this person also wrote that they're praying for me. Shout out to that man, so sweet. You got a soul hug, by the way, I'm gonna tell you that. <laughs> um, you obviously always start with prayer. And this is where I found, so I took it, uh, forgive me if this is not what you were asking, I took it in the thought of dating relationships and why the church's teaching on premarital sex and chastity are so important because you can authentically believe that this person is trustworthy. And if they actually may be, but something may change in their life. And if you've gone in an intimate way with somebody and that thing changes and they're no longer trustworthy, now you're hurt. Now pain seeps in because you've given them something physical. You've given them something that connects you physically, and that is very painful, very painful. And I don't speak from my own experience, but I speak from my high schoolers that I worked with. Like I cried with people as they struggled to reconcile what just happened in their relationship. And so I know people are like, ah, oh, chastity, purity, abstinence, that. No, for real, like it's to protect you as well. And so um, there's that piece, and then in Surat, Surat, Sriracha. 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 No, no, I know it's not that one. I know it's not that one. Uh, Sirach. There it is, man. I don't mind preaching. Uh, Sirach in 6.6 six says, what was that fun? Um, Let those who are friendly to you be many, but one in a thousand your confidant. So I say that for two reasons. One is to understand the depth of trust for certain people. You have to have varying levels. So when I speak to you, I will be very open about my life. But when I'm talking about my deepest struggles, it is one in a thousand that will hear from that part of my life. But that one in a thousand can also be your guide in addition to your prayer life of is this person in my life good for me? Because they know you so deeply and they want to love you. So if you're dating someone bad, they're probably gonna let you know. And so you can also use their, their, like their thought to say, is this, is this somebody I should trust? Um, 
How can we question the church in a good way so we can see if it has fallen away from the true faith in God? Uh, I'm going to mend your question just a little bit to say that how can we question the people of the church? Because the church is solid. The teachings are solid. The church is not the problem, it's the people. And so we want to figure out um, that distinction. The other piece too, and I say this hesitantly because I have seen where the church has protected people that shouldn't have protected. But you also want to be careful to stay in your lane. Specifically, I hear people like bashing the Pope. Stay in your lane. That's not, that is not you. Like, that is not yours to take care of. The Pope is the, like, the, that, that is St. Peter in his line. And then I'm gonna have the nerve to read an article and say, mm hmm, Pope Frank, I knew he should have been out. I knew he should have been out. If I was a cardinal, let me tell you. He said, no, Francis. No, stay in your lane. Now, if you're thinking like people around you, I actually go back to when we talked about how can we use our sufferings, you walk with that person. So for example, an easy one, um, just an FYI, for those of you that ask questions about same-sex attraction, transgender, I put that last because I was blessed because Chris asked me to come speak to those topics in a forum later. And so if we get there, awesome, but if we don't, I left those last on purpose I love those questions. I love you for asking them. Please don't think I'm ignoring them for any other reason other than we're going to get to them later. Um, but it's you want to walk with that person. So if you see they're good Catholics, but they're struggling with that teaching, walk with that person. Because more than likely, they've been introduced to the teaching. If they haven't been introduced to the teaching, you walking with them, you'll figure that out. And you'll say, you know what, you seem to have a misunderstanding with this. And let me just tell you what the church authentically teaches. And then build the conversation from there. Um, oh, the other part is I look to Jesus for these types of things. Um, okay, I didn't have time to make sure this was, was not a lie. So potentially heresy. But um, I found a thing that said that Jesus asked 300, 307 questions. He was asked 183 and only answered three. So the man that literally formed the world gave three answers. And so we see the power of an intelligent question. Bless you. I told you there was three. <laughs> and so we want to make sure that we're not forcing answers. We just say, hey, um, have you considered this? And make them think. You're not forcing anything on them. You're just asking them to think. And in that process, God will work. Uh, yeah. So before I get to the next session, which is some random questions, uh, <laughs> I just put them all in one section. Uh, any questions to this point? Go on, my brother. So you talked earlier about the role of motion and prayer. I was wondering if you had to say about uh, what is the purpose of, uh, how, how do you think that should discipline your emotions? Ooh, that's a great question. I think it also depends on who you're with. Because um, if you discipline it to the point where you like shut people out of them, like you're hiding them from people, that is probably Satan trying to trick you into closing out your one in thousands from your life. Uh, but if you find that like you're crying often, or you're angry often, I think you want to find the root of that. Because when you, I would, I think of it, so another will give you a different answer, but I think of it as when they're out of control, something else is wrong. And so if I'm disciplining my emotions without finding the source of why they're out of control, I'm doing it in the wrong order. I think as I find peace for what is causing that emotion, I'll find that that emotion finds its proper place. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Good question, brother. Anything else? Mm, good. So. <laughs> Sorry. 
I like it. I like it. This, this one made me laugh. Is the Holy Eucharist a protein or a carb? <laughs> uh, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. And, and this is how you know I spent too much time in seminary when I philosophize the question. And I, I think it actually comes down to simply, we know, uh, I'll say, it is taught, so you may not know, but it is taught that the accidents of the bread and the wine don't change. It is the substance. So for example, if somebody that we don't know loses an arm, I ain't putting that on anybody in our lives, loses an arm, that is an accidental change to their body, but it doesn't change them substantively. For the bread and the wine, it changes their substance to be Jesus, but not their accidents. Therefore, it's a car. Um, <laughs> How do you explain the difference between receiving the Eucharist on the tongue versus the hands? Um, shout out to y'all listening to the videos from yesterday. Um, I, so I take this for me answering the question for you. You can find smarter people to answer, but in my thought, it's the thought that we know that every particle of Jesus in the host is him, regardless of how big or how small. And so when we receive on the tongue, we lessen the chance of accidentally losing particles to the floor. Now, obviously, it was thrown on its head with COVID. And so what I want to explain is when we receive on the hand, because in my mind, and the part that they explained to us as seminarians, the priest holds Jesus. So obviously, the idea of Jesus being in the hand, he has approved. But if you notice the priest and the extraordinary uh, ministers of Holy Communion, after they are done, they will dip their hands in what's called the oblation, the oblation, no, I shouldn't even have said it. They'll dip their hands in water. <laughs> um, as a way to make sure that all particles of Jesus are accounted for, so to speak. And that water is handled in a very like, particular way. And so when we receive on the hand and we don't consider, is anything left on the hand? Even in a prayerful way, if I walk away, Jesus may have fallen to the ground. And so for me, when we were asked to receive on the hands, um, something that you can look ridiculous, like you don't want to be obnoxious about it, but you can see, is, is there a particle still left? And for when we were asked to not to, I would just dip my finger on my tongue and gently pick up the particles I could see and then consume them as well. So instead of having to do all that, receiving on the tongue kind of just all encompasses that. But if you want to still receive on the hands, particularly right now, just take an extra precaution to know that Jesus like resides in your hand for the second before you receive, and make sure that you're not accidentally letting him fall to the floor in any form. Um, this same person, no, last, it was the next person, that had asked a similar question, and then had asked, how many angels rebelled against God? So I just went to Revelations, um, chapter 12, 3 to 4, and it talks about the big dragon, uh, I'm assuming that's Satan, um, and he hurled a third of the stars in the sky to the earth with his tail. So I believe, I am not blaspheming heretic to say that that can be interpreted as those are then the fallen angels. Um, I heard somebody say that there are billions upon billions of angels. Um, so I would imagine that God also lost quite a few um, to, to heaven. They just didn't choose him. Um, and so that's my best guess. Uh, but also, slight side note, that's why um, like, God bless you, Jack. You good? All right. If you come back, though, no more blessings. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's but like to know that many like angels intellectually are superior than us. And so when you hear people say, "Don't mess with Ouija boards," or they got all sorts of random stuff now. I mean, this um, you don't play with devils. Know that they are there. There was a lot of them, not to scare you, but I had read from an exorcist that if we could see demonic presence, the amount of them would block out the sun 
for her. They're everywhere. But be at peace, my friends, because he only took a third. And we each have our own protector, and then we have hierarchy to work with. So our guardians are the lowest, and they still can kick the butt of any demon. Why? Because they are still on God's side. So I tell you to be careful with demons, but do not fear demons because we are on the winning side. Feel me? Uh, how is the Eucharist created? Mm, um, that's tough. So I just kept it simple and just said, like, this is why having a properly ordained priest is necessary because it is through the Holy Spirit, through the ordained minister, that God allows the bread and the wine to change to the body and the blood which is why you hear priests in other denominations that do not have that same power because it has to be the proper form of an ordained minister and that's how it happened. How God does it otherwise, ask him. Um, same person that asks, what if hell doesn't exist? This is gonna take more explanation after, but I give this for food for thought. If hell doesn't exist, then we have no authentic freedom because if we cannot choose not God, then we have no freedom. We have to choose God. And so God would create hell to allow us freedom to choose him. Um, how did God create us? I just took Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust and of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Did that really happen? Sure, like it could. Um, somebody had asked, like, do I believe in the Big Bang, or do I believe in the seven-day creation story. The church has not condemned either one. Um, in fact, if you, I was looking at a video that was talking about um, the Big Bang because I feel like that, for me, is where I put my time in because that is where I feel like I will win more souls that are lost is being able to speak with them in more scientific terms. Um, and they actually can find that the universe was started in a very, very small spot. And they cannot get beyond to see where it came from before that. And the world is continuing to expand. And so the idea that God could create that bit to form this, my God is powerful, man. My God does what he wants. And so if you want to believe in the Big Bang, more power to you. If you want to believe in the seven day creation, that's going to be trickier for you to win others with that thought, but there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, will God forgive every single sin that we make? You also got a soul hug. Absolutely he will. God desperately wants you. And so if you go to confession with a contrite heart, yes, absolutely. But then somebody asks a very good question. If somebody sinned two times and confesses one of the sins, but not the other, thinking more um, mortal sin, because you don't have to con confess every venial sin that you committed in confession. That's unnecessary. But every mortal sin, you do. If you did not leave out the mortal sin on purpose, because confession can make you nervous sometimes. So if you did not leave it out on purpose, you may receive, but you do want to confess that the next time you go to confession. Follow me? Yeah. Um, how do I know that I'm a good person? So the short answer is this. you created by God, man. <laughs> it's just good that you exist, period. Now, if you're asking, how do I know that I'm on the path to righteousness? That is where our whole prayer discussion comes into play. Because you will see, as you have a better relationship with him, that your interactions with those around you just change. They just become purified. And so you'll note the difference of God in your life. And you'll be able to see it. People will also be able to see it in you. And your path to righteousness is different. Because you being here, man, you're so good. It's so good that you are here. Um, please explain how we have free will, even though God knows everything. Shows. Okay. <laughs> so the easiest way that I have come to understand it for myself is 
if you think of all of time as a giant circle, so if you need to visualize, just look at your table. God is in the center, and he sees all parts of time as if it were his presence. So he sees us in this moment as he sees Jesus crucified. It is his presence. So he does not know the future to make it sound like we have to act for our God to always be right. He just sees what we're doing at all times. And in the same way, we can see an accident about to happen and not cause it to happen. He can see us act and try to guide us but not take away our free will. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit work with that. Um, does God love the people in hell? He created them too. Yeah. And that's where the free will comes. He loves them so much that he will allow them to choose not him. And that is not his hope. That is not his aim. But if we do that, he will lovingly allow us to go to hell. Um, if God is our Father, how can we also be His friends? I would say, in my own thought, that we are more friends with the person of Jesus, and through Jesus, we can see God the Father as a friend, but I think you're right to ask that question. God the Father is a bit different than having a friendship with the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and then, I will end with these last two, unless I'm told I'm cool otherwise, but I will allow that um, discussion to happen without somebody having to cut me off. Um, what if we are allowed to do things with, like receive on the hand, change days, uh, holy days of obligation. So like for example, Ascension used to be on a Thursday, it was holy day of obligation. Now for our diocese, it's been moved to a Sunday. And so I think this person is saying, are we making Catholicism too easy? Like are we, um, lessening requirements too much. And uh, another had asked, why doesn't the church enforce abstinence of meat on Fridays? Um, it used to ask for that. Um, so that one's much easier to say, they still ask for a penance on Fridays to remember Jesus' death. But I think, I believe it was wise to say, meat, fish, lobster, crab, we don't care anymore. So if you're just like, always, avoid meat, that becomes easy and an unnecessary thing to enforce in a sense to say you will probably do better now choosing your own penance or your own sacrifice for Friday in substitution for meat or still abstain from meat on Friday if that would be difficult for you. Um, so I think in that same mindset that's how they've done it with Holy Days of Obligation as well. If you want the depth of the faith, it is still there for you. Like the Easter Triduum is not a requirement, but to go Holy Thursday, Good Friday, to the Easter Vigil is beautiful. And so the church offers you that beauty, but will not make you a sinner for not choosing. And so I think it's not trying to make it easier, but just trying to be more loving. And then for that person who asked that question, I encourage you to go out of your way to invite for parts that you think people have lost. So Holy Thursday, if this is you and you're like, people are missing it, invite them, my sister and my brothers. Like, invite them to Jesus. We don't need to make them sinners to force them to come. Let your love for God flow through you to invite them into his love. Questions? Go for um, On the subject of the Big Bang Theory, I think it is worth mentioning with the guy that created it. Thank um, you. Belgian Catholic priest, I don't speak Waffle, but the French pronunciation would be George de Dominique. Um, so I encourage people to look that up and be curious about it. And I've also heard it said that, uh, I mean, I personally lean towards believing the Big Bang Theory because I think it's a lot cooler to believe that everything was started in a single moment and everything was played out in like the heat, light, magnetism, uh, electricity, gravity, like everything was created this specific moment for hopefully our sanctification. Which I think is a lot cooler than just about being like, hey, you exist now. It's so, cooler for sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my um, I was also just going to say, like, with the uh, with the questions on, like, hell and why, like, 
God lets it exist. I really like something that my theology professor said, because um, he said that God, it would be unloving for God to not permit there be a hell, because if someone really doesn't want to be with him, to be in the presence of him would be torture for that person. So in a loving way, he allows them to choose to be away from him, rather than force them, rather than force someone, because if you hold someone against their will, they're not happy either. So in a loving sense, like he let them choose freely, and it's a loving thing, like it hurts him to not have that person there, but it's almost like he um, allows that to be loving. Like it doesn't take away God's love, it's a form of his love to let them go because they don't want him. And I just like that perspective of it. I think it helped me at least. Like other people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, sir. This is kind of not related to much that you said, but it's just on my mind. <laughs> um, Go ahead. How do you avoid self righteousness as a Catholic? How do you avoid self righteousness? Off the top, I would say, um, so I'm taking a little bit, mm, ah. so I'm gonna say it, and if it means something to you, awesome. If not, I think you'll still get it. I'm taking a little bit from St. Teresa of Lisieux's a little way, which is um, to recognize better, like where we're weaker. Because I think, um, and I'm very careful in saying this, I think self-righteousness can be seen almost as like a mental health challenge. Because I find self-righteousness to be a protection of like, no, I'm not, like I don't want to be considered weak. And so I'm pushing away the idea that there's anything wrong with me with this layer of holiness. And, uh, and so I, I, I think being open and honest with yourself. Um, to, and the other part for prayer that I didn't say is um, journaling. Some people enjoy drawing. Like experiment, like no joke, I have a pair of very small earbuds and I will be in adoration listening to music. That uh, make sure it's not loud enough to distract, don't do that. But for me, like music can stir the soul. And I think particularly with journaling, and you slow your thoughts down, you'll be able to find where God is trying to bring you to a holier place. Is that fair enough for? Yeah. You want me to go on or? That's what I thought. So. Um, so let's just close with prayer. So you want to pray? In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, obviously, each answer has a more significant depth, and there are questions that are still on their hearts. May they never see, stop seeking you, because this church and her teachings have every answer. And may they never be confused or lost enough to think that they will find something better than you and your church. And may you guide them and show them your loving presence, particularly in this adoration that they go to next. Mom, I don't know what else to ask for, so if you could ask your son on our behalf, so we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.